Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I started out, I have a degree in computer science. Uh, I'm one of the few black women, unfortunately, that that is true of. Um, and I've been fortunate enough over the course of my career to work on some pretty transformative technologies. So uh, I was an engineer on something called Shockwave, which was the first time that the web moved. Uh, I helped launch Hulu. I ran digital at BET, the television network, Black Entertainment Television. Um, and then I worked at the White House under President Obama where I served as the Chief Digital Service Officer for the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, and then uh, leaving that in the administration, trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, I started Techwitable, uh, which is where I am the CEO and founder. So for everyone who's just joining us, I'm just going to get you to back it up a bit. You used to work for Obama. Like, what was that like? Tell us about the moment when he asked you to come and join his administration. Yeah, um, that was pretty remarkable. Like, that's one of the things that, you know, kind of, I, I grew up low income in New York. It was not, you know, when I grew up, I wasn't like, when I grew up one day, I'm going to work at the White House for the president, for the first black president. Uh, but so it was a pretty incredible uh, journey. I don't actually think I shared with you how, um, how, how I, it came to be. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible story. So I, um, I, I got a call. I was sitting at my desk at BET. I got a call from the White House um, asking me to come down for a uh, for a roundtable. They were trying to figure out how they were going to uh, use government, uh, use technology to improve the way government served the American people. And uh, and I was like, sure, you know, the White House calls, you say yes. <laughs> um, but then they were hemming and they were hawing. And I was like, look, I have a vacation planned. Once you get your schedule together, let me know, and I will let you know if I can come. Um, so, get it together, Obama. Yeah. <laughs> turns out scheduling the president is hard, but I had no idea. Like it was, it was, it was the office of the CTO that had called, right? Like I didn't know, and so I did end up cutting my vacation short. I flew by just by a day. I flew down to DC, and like, but it was a complete surprise. So we walk into the uh, uh, into the what's it called, the Roosevelt Room. Um, which is directly across from the Oval Office. But again, like, I don't, I know nothing about government, the White House. The only reason I know that the West Wing is in the White House is because there was a TV show. An amazing <laughs> TV show, by the way. Just a little side note, if anyone hasn't watched it, great what? time to do it now, all the time in the world. <laughs> 100%. Aaron Sorkin is amazing. Right, right. Uh, and it will make you long for other times. <laughs> Um, no, and so, you know, when I got there, it was the Chief Technology Officer of the United States of America, uh, the Chief Information Officer, and the, uh, I think it was the Deputy Administrator of uh, the Office of Management and Budget, which apparently controls the entire federal government's purse strings. So again, I know, I'm like, what's happening here? They take you to a room, and they're, they close the door, and they're like, surprise, this is actually a recruiting trip. And I'm like, I don't, wait, what now? <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> Uh, and then they proceed for the next 45 minutes to give us the, literally the like hardest sell you have ever seen, right? It's very like, you will have, never have so much impact in your life. You know, the president wants us to be part of his legacy. Like, it's just this whole, you're like, I don't, what, what is happening? Like I was, I'm here for a round table. Um, so it was a lot. And then, um, and then the door opens and in walks the president. And this is how you know that I am a totally a jaded New Yorker, because I'm because <laughs> he walks in with a videographer and a photographer and he goes around and he shakes all of our hands. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Nice touch. It's a photo op. Like, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then he sits down with us for 45 minutes. Uh, and I will say, and then he talks about like, you know, um, the, the government is bureaucratic, but the White House isn't, you know, I'm at the end of my second term, I care even less about breaking the rules. Like, it's this whole, like, if I have to call your mother, your sibling, your child, I will. Uh, we all laugh, and he's like, I'm not joking. It, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's everything. Yeah. And people ask me afterwards, like, oh, are you going to do this? And I was like, I think when the President of the United States asked you to do something, the only answer is yes, sir. Um, and I will say, so it's one of those things, like the story is amazing. Uh, and I was so grateful to have that time, that opportunity and to be personally recruited by the president. But I will also say, I don't tell that story very often um, because, because there's some level of um, 
of, of the president invited me, like I was the asshole that didn't go do the good work until the president personally asked me to, right? I got to the Department of Education and there are people there who are brilliant, who've worked there for eight years and 10 years and 30 years and show up every single day and put one foot in front of the other because they're trying to make the world a better place for students. And they're the ones that deserve the recognition and the credit and the, and the shine and the spotlight. And it was just like, that's the, they show up and they do the work every day and have been for years. And so while my experience was incredible from my perspective, it was really those folks who were the, the real heroes. Oh, that's so interesting. And you're so humble to say that though, at the same time, because I, I hear you that th those people that do that work every day, like absolutely deserve all of our thanks and praise all the time. But I mean, you did work for the White House, Obama did personally recruit you. What an amazing story. Thanks for sharing that with us. But I mean, that's, that's like, that's like a dot, a, like a blip almost in your career kind of radar, really, because you've had an amazing career. And we want to talk today about like microaggressions and, and how you handle those in the workplace. And I guess like, can you also just give us some background? Like you mentioned earlier that you're a woman of color, you're a woman of color working in technology. I mean, even now, even now there are not that many women of color working in technology. When you started in your career, what was that like for you kind of, you know, being essentially being, being a minority in, in your chosen career path? Yeah. You know, um, it's really interesting. I, I, there are, there's a lot more people paying attention to that these days. And in the eighties, there were actually a lot more women in computer science. Uh, by the time I kind of came on, like I was at the cusp of the, the, the kind of the digital age, the internet age. And so, you know, shockwave was kind of the, the, the kind of, right at the cusp of when the internet kind of went more mainstream. And so there was a little bit of a shift from, from there was definitely women in the industry uh, before I got there. Um, but they, they were kind of working on, 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 on it, was, it was less the, the kind of the new, um, the new kind of, I don't wanna say technologies, but the new kind of um, orientation for the industry. Um, and look, it's so, it's so funny, like I have, um, so I've worked in technology, I've worked in media and entertainment. I worked in the federal government. I also have a random connection to USA Gymnastics because I'm a professional gymnastics photographer as well. Uh, and so it's just one of those things of like all, all roads were clearly pointing towards, towards this, right? And my experience has been, you know, being the only and the other for my entire career. Um, and, uh, you know, and, it's, and, it's, and it manifests in so many different ways, whether it's, you know, I literally, been except for my current company i have literally been taken for the administrative assistant at every single organization i've ever worked at and i have been a vice president for going on 20 years now uh and i don't and i dress pretty like i dress pretty businessy i dress all and i just you know you get to a point where and I, right you get to a point where you you take it as a compliment it just means that i'm approachable and accessible and super efficient and effective at doing my job i love the framing on this i'm loving finding the positive in this that's awesome <laughs> Um, yeah, and, so, and so like, can you tell us, I mean, can you give us an example perhaps of some of the microaggressions and perhaps being mistaken um, is an example of that. For people who don't know, like what is a microaggression and how yeah. does it manifest in the work? Yeah. Um, so I guess let me give a little bit of context. So the thing that I'm doing now is called Techwitable, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a technology company using uh, technology to make uh, workplaces more equitable. And really our mission is about creating work culture that's gonna work for everyone. Uh, and so I started doing, what, one of the things is we've created this platform where people can come and figure out how to handle interpersonal conflict, workplace misconduct, or just get advice. It's a safe place where they can get advice if they're feeling uncomfortable in the workplace. And one of those things, part of the reasons why we built this is, is we heard from so many people about like, well, I don't know if this thing happened, like, does it really cross a line? Is it just me? Am I being too sensitive? And so we realized that there is, I mean, we actually, we help companies address issues from subtle to severe, right? From, uh, you know, it's not just my boss grew up in the bathroom, but it's the more subtle, insidious death by a thousand paper cuts that really affect people's day-to-day -day work lives, right? And so, um, and it was one of those, so it's, it's the things like, you know, my boss tried to touch my dreadlocks or I'm always mistaken for the other person of my race in my building. Um, and, but it's really those things that, that are, are lacking that people don't really talk about enough. It's around the microaggressions. It's around these, these subtle kind of backhanded compliments. And the reason it's so important is that I realized 
I only talk about these things within my communities, right? So I'm not talking to white women about kind of the slights that happen to me because I'm black or, or light skinned or whatever it is, right? Like I am not talking to white men about my experience about having somebody, you know, stare at my boobs. Like those are not things that I talk outside of like, like my space and my people given whatever the environment is. And I realized that there was something there about, about opening up these conversations, about, about talking about it out loud that gives it the space to be, to be handled and dealt with. And, and, and it actually makes for a, a healthier work environment if we are addressing some of these things, but there's, there's clarity and there's space around it. No, that, that's, that's, that's so interesting that you say that. And we're going to put a link to Techquitable in the comments and obviously um, when we post this online as well, so people can check it out. And, and just for people who don't know, it's anonymous. So, so anything that you report on the Techquitable platform um, is anonymous. And so it's a really great way to kind of, um, for employers, I suppose, to get that feedback about what's really going on in your organization. If people are managing a team and if they've not had that experience of being another or, you know, um, feeling objectified or feeling uncomfortable, what can they do to kind of foster a workplace and a culture that is um, inclusive, that is safe, and that is also open to feedback if they make a mistake so that people don't kind of feel like they can't put a foot wrong. Is there any advice that you have for people? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, the examples of what microaggressions look like, especially this backhanded compliments, right? The, 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 the insidious part of it, it's, it's those things of like, oh, you're being too sensitive about this. Oh, she didn't really mean it like that, right? And it's really about learning that it's about the, the impact, not the intention, right? It's about how it's received on the other end. And so those are the things about, right, oh, you're black, but you're so articulate. Or you're too pretty to be an engineer. Or, oh, you know, yes, you're a third generation Amer Asian American, but you speak English so good, right? It's those kinds of things that really kind of get into your psyche. And there's a lot of stuff that there's research that actually shows that um, that, that insidious, the insidious nature of it is actually can be worse uh, for the recipient of it than kind of more, uh, more obvious aggressions, right? Because it's, it, you start to question yourself and, and, and all of a sudden like, are you the person who's like challenging them? Oh, they, it was just a joke. Oh, you're taking it the wrong way. Those kinds of things start to also make you question your response and your reaction to it. So, um, and so that's one of the things that we try to do, right, is, is, is give this platform where people can see themselves reflected, right? They understand that other people are going through these same things. And so what can you do about it in your workplace, in your environment? I think it depends on kind of what your, what your role is, right? So if it's happened to you, you know, it really is about like, how do you, how can you respond in a way that might get heard, but where you still might feel safe, right? And there's, there's actually a lot of research that shows that if you say it, um, that if you say something that people will actually hear you and you can change people's behavior. And again, there's that balance about like putting the onus on the people who are, are feeling compromised, right? You don't ask, you don't ask the homeless to solve world hunger. Right. So there's, there's something there about that balance. Um, but there's something about figuring out how to say something um, uh, in the moment. But but you have to actually first figure out how you are going to feel about it, whether you think it will get heard, you would think, think it will be received. There yeah. is, of course, if you inadvertently said something or did something or that somebody interpreted or, or received in a way that they were offended by, um, then then the amount the like you'd be surprised at how far an I'm sorry goes, right? It's not, it's, it's, but it's also super hard to not be defensive, but I didn't mean it that way. How do you take a step back and, and kind of let it wash over you and hear it and internalize it and understand that it really is about, again, the impact that you might have had on somebody, whether it was intentional or not. That's what I know you've got some resources um, that you want to share that kind of step people through that. Do you want to bring those up just so people can get a sense? Um, we're going to wrap it up soon, but if anyone has questions for Lisa, feel free to send them through on the chat as well. So impactful, Lisa. It's really, really interesting, all these things that you're saying. And I, I think you're so right, like, I'm not being defensive if you're the one that makes that mistake. I think that's a great lesson for all of us. Um, so do you want to talk us through, you know, what these steps encourage us to do? 
right, I'll just power through these really quickly because there's four different kind of roles that, that play in here, right? So if you personally have been offended, what can you do, right? Ensure that you're safe, assume the best of intentions. You can ask questions. What did you mean by that? I'm not sure I'm following. I don't understand. Why would you say that? What is the like? So just kind of ask questions to kind of help somebody maybe self-realize like what, what the subtext of what they were saying is. Um, using I statements, right? It's really like when you did such and such, it made me feel this one away because uh, it, it, that's one of the, of the tricks of, of helping people not feel defensive. Um, I will move on to the next one, which is so if you've unintentionally offended, right? First and foremost, listen, recognize the impact. Uh, I help try to understand why the comment was offensive. Like, and you know what? Educate yourself, right? Again, it doesn't have to depend on somebody else, but listen. Uh, apologize authentically, curio uh, demonstrate curiosity and, and, um, and humility, thank them for the feedback. If you're a bystander, right, so this is the other one, which is if you are, um, if, if you see something happening, yeah. you can speak up, right? The role of an ally can be huge. Like it's not hero, but it is like, and you don't have to be like, well, that was offensive to her. You can say that was offensive to, you, to yourself. Like that's okay, like own that. Um, I mean, especially at the moment, I mean, not especially, but I mean, one thing that I, that, that I will say that a lot of people have been observing in person, I've not seen it myself, but one of my best friends saw it on the streets of New York, is people being um, highly racist and offensive to people of Asian descent because of the coronavirus. So I think that this bystander information is very pertinent to a lot of us right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And I was, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, which is, so after September 11th, so apparently I look Arab, which I, I travel in Europe, so I know that to be true. Um, but I will tell you, I was in New York after September, uh, so I lived in New York, so I was in New York for September 11th. I will tell you, it was very uncomfortable walking around the streets. Uh, I, was, I was feeling very threatened and very, like, I had to, I, I went home to be safe. And it is, it's, it is this, this feeling of, yeah, it's it's a terrible time right now. It's just a terrible time. Um, so yeah, I think I think bystanders are really important always. And then there's of course if you are in HR or doing diversity and inclusion work, right? It's um, part of it is acknowledging ex its existence, right? Giving it th its moment, right? Just because people aren't coming to you about it, you're not hearing about it, doesn't mean it's not happening. And so, how do you proactively try to get in front of some of these issues and, and, and tackle these kinds of work environments? And, you know, you can set up systems in place where people actually have a safe place where they can reflect and discuss. Um, some of it's about exposure and education. Some of it's about, like, setting up employee resource groups or affinity groups um, and figuring out how to tackle it, not just at the individual level, but also at the institutional level, at the cultural level, um, and really make it be part of everyday conversation, right? It shouldn't, again, be on our, us as, it should not be our burden to bring it forward and to, and to have it, and to raise it as, as points of discussion. That actually, mm -hmm. everybody should own that and participate in that. So that's, that's it's it's so valuable and I really appreciate you sharing this because you know I think it's very valuable to hear from someone else's perspective um how these situations um can make them feel have we lost the screen oh there we go we're back um I've put the link in the chat so people, people can can find out more about Techquitable if they want to connect with you they can find you on LinkedIn um we're so grateful for you sharing your wisdom with us today about you know that cumulative impact that happens with those everyday microaggressions and you know, the hugely negative impact that that can have on, on the people on the receiving end of that. And I love that you gave tips for bystanders because I think sometimes people feel frozen and they feel, well, it doesn't happen to me. So what would I, I know? What could I do? And I, I love that advice that you've given. So I've certainly taken a lot away from today. Thank you. Um, and we're just delighted that Techquitable is going so well and we're very excited to see it, um, you know, across all institutions in America and, you know, I'm sure the world eventually, um, if that's not already happening. So Lisa, thank you for all that you've done and for being such a trailblazer in the tech space. Um, you're an amazing role model to so many of us working in technology and we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited to actually get to, uh, to see your audience and participate and engage with, with both you and them. So this is amazing. Thank you for organizing this. Bye.